Welcome back. In this episode, we are concluding our story on the father of Japanese whiskey. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'll have it linked in the show description. It's a great story of a man's unique passion leading him on a journey to a far-off country, where he finds not only the knowledge and skills he was seeking, but also a woman that he loves. But on this episode, that love is going to be tested. Behind every bottle is hundreds of stories, every step starting from growing grain until it reaches your glass. This spirit is collecting experiences and stories that I would love to tell you. It's my goal to sift through these stories, find the most meaningful, and bring them forward to your attention. This isn't another whiskey review channel or show, this is pure storytelling. I won't analyze every detailed tasting note of the spirit in the bottle, instead, I'll dive into the details of the spirit behind the bottle. And this is the spirit of Taketsuru. Now, where were we? Taketsuru had gone abroad to study in Scotland, had met a young woman named Rita, the two just got engaged. He got to try some of the whiskey he had made the year prior, all was going well. And then... Rita's father suddenly passed, right as Taketsuru was having to leave her to go to a different region of Scotland to get more hands-on experience. One of the professors Taketsuru had impressed introduced him to a friend, Dr. Eines, who was studying malt whiskies and blends in Campbelltown. He had agreed to take Taketsuru on as a pupil and the two would have many academic conversations together as Dr. Eines was fascinated with the approach sake takes to convert the starches in rice into sugars so they can be made into alcohol. Taketsuru stayed six months in Campbelltown, studying their approach to blending. The last of Taketsuru's studies was grain whiskey. This different style was heavily utilized in blended whiskey, like what he had studied with Dr. Eines, and was produced in a different type of still, a coffee still, which is a precursor to the column still, but much more finicky to regulate an operation. Takatsuru would be working at the Johnny Walker facility near Glasgow, where three weeks went by watching them use the still without even a hint that they would let him touch it. When finally they warmed up to him, he remembers that Mr. Grant said, you want to try operating it, right? I start the night shift after tomorrow, so show up at night and I'll teach you. He would learn how to operate the difficult valves and how to work with the different grains than the malt he was already used to. This was the last of his education. Takatsuru was ready to return to Japan. However, he wanted to bring back one more thing with him. A wife. After the death of Rita's father, that plan became increasingly difficult. Her mother was opposed to the marriage, partially because it was so soon after the death of Rita's father, and because he was going to take Rita back with him to Japan. Takatsuru had written to Japan and informed his boss and parents about his intent, and his family was also against the marriage. They responded in a letter, no matter what happens, do not marry a blue-eyed English. We quit the sake business and passed it to our relatives for you and let you go to England. Now it's time to accept our request. There are plenty of decent choices for wives here. His mother even offered to send pictures of potential matches for him. But the two young lovers had some allies. Rita's two sisters would strongly pressure their mother into accepting and Taketsuru, he had his boss, Abe. Abe made another visit to Taketsuru's family, where he offered to go to Scotland and bring back Taketsuru. Now, what sources I found on the meeting between Taketsuru's family and Abe simply says that they had a long conversation into the night, and in the morning decided that not only would Abe go to Scotland, but if he approved of Rita, the family would give their blessing. Personally, as Abe is the president of a spirits company, and looking at the sudden change in opinion from Takatsuru's family, 
I choose to believe that Abe brought more than a couple drinks, and as the night sped by, the family became increasingly trusting and their good friend's judgment. Shortly after this meeting, Takatsuru received a telegram from Abe, which read in full, I'm going to the UK. Abe. After waiting for two long months, Abe is in Scotland. The acceptance of the intended wedding lies in the hands of Takatsuru's boss, who is still a stranger to Rita, and, Rita not yet being fluent in Japanese, wouldn't even be able to fully communicate with him. The two must have been tense as they meet him in the Portland Hotel. Abe quickly took a liking to Rita, telling Takatsuru, She's nice and quite beautiful. Let's take her back to Japan. Rejoicing, the couple took Abe to Rita's family and were soon married in Glasgow. He would travel with Abe for a bit throughout Europe, acting as a guide in some spots and seeing how the now ended world war had decimated others. And soon, it was time for the long journey home. The three travelers, Takatsuru, Rita, and Abe, retraced his original journey, going by ship, this time in a straight line, to New York, then a train to California. They would not get the chance to view the wineries, as America had made a big change. It was 1921, Prohibition was in full swing. Having no reason to linger in America then, they immediately left for Japan. The second ship of the journey landed them in Yokohama, then off to Tokyo. On this leg of the trip to Tokyo, a confused Rita saw rice fields for the first time. Abe even had a home already lined up for them, complete with a western-style toilet to make Rita feel at home. It had been agreed that of the 150 yen per month that Takatsuru would be paid as a chief engineer, 55 would go to the monthly rent of the house. However, Takatsuru's dream of making whiskey in Japan still wouldn't be easy to turn into reality. The liquor industry was hurting worldwide post-war, and the company Shetso Suzo was hit hard. Now wasn't the time to start a new venture, especially one like whiskey, where it needs to mature for years before a profit could be made. Takatsuru pleaded with Abe, even proposing a scaled-down plan to give him a small pot still in an empty warehouse for production. Abe brought this idea to the board of directors, not wanting to waste Takatsuru's potential, but they unanimously voted against it. Frustrated and disappointed, Takatsuru felt like he was not needed with the company if they wanted to continue to simply make the poor imitation spirit. So, in 1922, he resigned from the company, to which Abe responded, That's too bad. Takatsuru would spend the next couple months teaching chemistry, while Rita taught English, making ends meet until he could once again find an opportunity to chase his passion. In early 1923, that opportunity knocked on his door. Shinjiro Tori, the man he had met early on in the Western Spears Division, was now standing before him. He was working for Kotobukiya, and was looking to make real whiskey. Tori had originally wanted to pay someone from Scotland to move to Japan, but after hearing about Takatsuru's experience in education, decided to call upon his old co-worker. The two quickly formed a contract. The endeavor was to be fully funded, Takatsuru would have complete control over the whiskey production, and would be paid a yearly salary of 4,000 yen. The contract was set for a duration of 10 years, as it was agreed that the whiskey would also mature under Takatsuru's watch. The one request that Tori did not accept was the proposed location. Takatsuru wanted to match the climate of Scotland as closely as possible, and had recommended Hokkaido. But Tori countered, saying that to have a successful project, they needed it to be closer to the people, so that they can see where and how it is being made. 
Takatsuru conceded this point, and the location was to be set near Osaka. Surveying the surrounding area, Takatsuru looked at the air quality, water purity, proximity to a river, availability of peat moss, and even more conditions, before deciding that Yamazaki was an ideal spot for whiskey production. The land was purchased in October 1923, less than five months after he had been hired into the company. Takatsuru personally ordered all the equipment, some from Scotland, and others to be manufactured in Japan to his exact specifications. He even made several trips to oversee and advise on the construction of the pot still. His notes from his studies in Scotland became invaluable to him. There was no one in the country he could consult on the subject or on measurements. But even after the challenge of producing equipment, there was still logistics of moving it to the new distillery. The still alone had to be shipped upriver, then moved by several horses, and needed special permission from the trains as the horses had to cross over the train tracks. The next big obstacle was the government. When they applied for a license to distill, the tax office didn't know how to classify it as no one had ever tried to make real whiskey before. Unwilling to make a decision, the local government sent the request to the Ministry of Finance. Even then, it wasn't until April of 1924 that they finally got the necessary clearance. When the distillery finally opened in November, it cost the company 2 million yen, or about $120 million, adjusted for inflation and exchange rate. But the government continued to be an obstacle, this time with taxes. In Japan, alcohol was taxed on how much was brewed, which isn't a problem for sake or beer, which is sold right away. But with whiskey, they would have to pay taxes immediately on whiskey that wouldn't even be close to being marketable for years, and on the original volume. A barrel isn't an airtight container. They can leak and cause a significant loss in product. And even if there are no leaks, a barrel will still lose 2 or 3% of its content a year to evaporation, which is known as the angel's share. Which, in a 10-year-old barrel, may mean a typical loss of 30 to 40%. And they would have already paid taxes on this lost product. So Takatsuru pleaded with a minister of finance, and after explaining this process to him, the minister agreed to change the tax structure for whiskey to one based on how Scotland taxed their distilleries. With all the equipment now in place, and the government cooperating with them, Takatsuru could finally get to work distilling whiskey. After the first distilling season, he would return to Scotland with samples of his distillate to show Dr. Eines, and to check some measurements his notes hadn't specified. Dr. Eines said that Takatsuru had done well, and after tasting the samples and asked some questions about how he had set up the production, Takatsuru returned to Japan, and kept working to improve and mature his young whiskey. Soon, four years went by. The age spirit was getting some color, and had started to mellow out. Not Takatsuru's ideal, but he recognized that the company needed to release something to the public. So their first public release was bottled under the name Shirafuda Suntori. The bottle was not nearly the success that Takatsuru or Tori had hoped for. Takatsuru wanted to bring that strong peat smoke to Japan and the young whiskey had not been able to spend enough time aging to keep the smoke from being too pungent, especially to the Japanese market that was not accustomed to that strong flavor. Fast forward another couple years to 1932. The oldest barrels are now about 7 years old, and there is no shortage of whiskey aging. But a tragedy strikes Takatsuru as he loses his mother suddenly, to an illness before he can even make it to her side. This sudden loss shakes Takatsuru to his core and makes him reevaluate where he is with his own goals in life. With less than a year left in his contract, 
He tells Tori that he intends to leave once it is up, and that he was going to try and create his own distillery. Something that he acknowledged wouldn't have been possible without Kotobukiya's influence. This separation also allowed Tori to make changes to the spirit that he thought were necessary, namely reducing the smoke to change the flavor profile to one that would be more acceptable to the Japanese palate. Making whiskey is a difficult endeavor, especially when you realize that a distillery needs to wait for years before it could be sold. And Takatsuru's flavors? Well, they require more than the bare minimum to become the nuanced spirit that he envisions. If he wants to start up his own distillery, he needs a product that they can sell while he is waiting for the whiskey to mature. So Takatsuru decides fruit juice would be an easy product that could be sold quickly to help keep his new proposed company afloat. He convinced three of his friends to pitch in some money and got a working capital of 100,000 yen. He quickly decided that Yochi would be an ideal location as he had his eye on the spot for some time before taking this leap. The location was near water and a port for shipping, had peat close at hand, and had fertile land growing in abundance of apples and grapes, perfect for his juice company to operate and grow into the intended distillery. Rita also welcomed the move. The climate and the landscape closely resembled her home of Scotland. She would even take the golf clubs she had brought with her and practice teeing off in the yard. Unfortunately, the juice business wasn't quite as easy as Takatsuru had hoped it would be. He had taken out a loan to start gathering equipment for whiskey production, but the business designed to keep him afloat while his whiskey rested in his barrel was struggling already. The juice company, named Dai Nippon Kaiju, or Great Japanese Juice, was facing issues such as snowfall causing the glue used for their labels to mold and slow turnover causing the juice to become cloudy and unappealing looking. The company was struggling, and the public knew it. Takatsuru was racing against the clock to get the whiskey production up and working before the juice would no longer support them. He finally started to get whiskey into barrels by 1936. They also started to release many more products to try and help diversify and keep the company holding on. While his whiskey was aging nicely, they added applesauce, apple jelly, and grape jelly to their lineup, and even an apple wine that they still continue to produce today. On September 1st, 1939, the actions of one man in Europe would change everything in the world. Germany invaded Poland, which would start World War II. As this action started to escalate into the overwhelming destruction we know it as today, Dai Nippon Kaiju shortened their name to Nika and released their first bottle, which was almost immediately met with price controls by the Japanese government as they were now at war. As the tragedies of war continued, the whiskey sat there quietly aging, set in two different warehouses, in case one might catch fire, so they wouldn't lose their entire aged stock. But for Takatsuru and Rita, life didn't go by so quietly. Japan had sided with the Axis countries, and the UK was an ally power. Rita was a Japanese citizen, so she was not forced into an internment camp, but the secret police viewed her as a potential spy, following her relentlessly, and even accusing her of having a secret radio to contact her home or a submarine. After the events of Pearl Harbor, her treatment only got worse, as neighbors that she had once thought of as friends now ignored her, as they didn't want to risk interaction, and the local children would pelt their house with rocks. The whole town viewed her as the enemy, and still she stayed and supported her husband's endeavor. Eventually, the war subsided, and slowly Nika grew in size and popularity. Kotobukiya would rebrand as Suntory, and would also continue to grow, until both Nika and Suntory both became world famous. 
in 2001, Nika's Yochi 10 was awarded Best of the Best by Whiskey Magazine. This brought the category of Japanese whiskey to the American public's attention and has allowed for the category to continue to grow. And that's where our story ends. I hope this has inspired you to try some Japanese whiskey and helped explain how one man's passion has resulted in a whole new category of whiskey and why most Japanese whiskey resembles the style of scotch. I also quickly want to thank Richard at Nomunication whose work on Japanese whiskey was invaluable while researching this story. He has a wonderful narrated map on the history of Japanese whiskey that I will have linked in the show description. Right next to the link to sign up for my mailing list. That way you can know when the next episode goes live. Maybe in the future I'll do an episode on another brand of Japanese whiskey, whose founder actually had crossed paths with Takasuru briefly in our story. But for now, I think I'm going to relax and raise a glass to the father of Japanese whiskey. On the next episode of The Spirit Of, we're going back to the founding fathers of America. There's a revolution, an uprising against the new government, one of the largest names in American history, and even his whiskey. I'll see you there.